my honor and pleasure to be here with Professor Shai Sekunda, who is um, a professor of Talmud at Bard University and is a faculty member at Drisha in, uh, in Manhattan and actually globally now as well. So thanks for taking some time to talk. Thanks so much. It's great to be here. So our topic of a transition from the black hat world to the academic Jewish studies world. I guess the first question I'd want to ask you um, is what are some of the what are some of the big differences between those two worlds? I mean, on the one hand, they're both learning Talmud almost all day, but there's obviously some glaring differences. Can you identify some of those? Yeah. Sure, and great question, and yeah. I think I'll do it biographically, right. uh, because I experienced both of these worlds, and I still, to some yeah. extent, live within both of these worlds. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, uh, already in high school, and then uh, for base marriage, yeah. for studying after high school, right. I studied in yeshiva in Baltimore, near Israel, which is a black hat yeshiva. Uh, which means that they wear black hats and they identify with a certain theology and ideology um, that could be called ultra-Orthodox, even if it's on the left end of the spectrum. While I was there, I was both completely enamored and fell in love with Talmud study uh, in its traditional vein, but I also started opening up to different ways of studying uh, Talmud academically. Um, my gateway drug was a library in Baltimore that was owned by uh, an institution that was called the Baltimore Hebrew University. I used to sit there on Fridays and read academic works on Talmud. Wow. Eventually, I wanted to apply uh, for graduate school. I went to Yeshiva University to study. Mm -hmm. uh, sort of the rest is history. I then was sort of fully immersed, at least intellectually, in the world of the university. Mm -hmm. So I constantly think about and thought about the differences between these different worlds. Um, and I think the primary difference besides, you know, the headgear of the black hat is um, is the reverence. And, you know, to be honest, uh, in the yeshiva, there is great reverence for the Talmudic text, so much so that uh, in certain ways it's seen as right. as divine, right. if not even more divine, right. than Torah Shabbat than, mm -hmm. the written, than the written Torah. Mm -hmm. uh, and on the other hand, in the university, in the academic world, uh, where Talmud is also studied, that reverence is not there. That doesn't necessarily mean that there is a negativity, uh, but there is criticism in the sense of detachment, which leads to better understanding. Mm -hmm. So we are trying to understand this text. In order to best understand it, we have to not fully express our love for it, mm -hmm. uh, and that way we can uh, you know, develop a deeper understanding. Mm -hmm. So there are many other kind of cosmetic and deeper differences, but to me, that is the primary difference that mm -hmm. I see mm -hmm. between these two what, what gets suppressed, mostly, when the Torah Shabbat Peh, when the oral tradition, the Talmud, is treated as divinely revealed. What gets intellectually suppressed? So precisely uh, this um, sort of critical thinking. Historical um, contextualization. Contextualization, right. in other words, even if you believe right. that this is somehow divinely inspired, yeah. uh, it was, these words were said right. by real human beings, right. real people who lived in places, who lived in spaces, yeah. who interacted with other human beings. Yeah. And if, you know, the reverence of the text is that this is, you know, sacred and it came down on Mount Sinai in the exact form that it is now, um, that, that leads to a certain poverty of your understanding. Mm -hmm. uh, but also sometimes if you're, uh, if you're too uh, respectful of a text, uh, if you're too even in love with a text, you sometimes miss certain aspects or qualities. I think in relation to something mm -hmm. like this mm -hmm. as, as well, in a positive sense, when you're deeply in love with someone, mm -hmm. you ignore the little you know, uh -huh. nuances, yeah. the little annoyances, because they don't exist for you. Mm -hmm. But if you really want to understand the full experience, the full picture, a, a, a picture you, need to, you need to acknowledge all of the different facets that you find within, within the Talmud. And that is often missing, suppressed yeah. from, from the yeshiva yeah. study. Yeah. Beautiful. So um, those are some of the differences. What are some of the commonalities? If you think of them as totally different worlds, but are there commonalities between those two worlds? So this yeah. is this is you know been the most interesting for me to yeah. both watch and see within myself yeah. and to acknowledge that there actually are great continuities, mm -hmm. uh, even particularly in some of the ways things that I described as differences. Uh, so there are strains of Talmud study, including the black hat world that I that I that I learned in, where. You're supposed to be, in the Yiddish, a shtikal api chorus, a little heretic, in order to be a bigger Talmud a bigger Torah scholar. So what that sometimes means is, uh, even practically in how one learns Talmud, traditionally you, you don't just learn the Talmud itself, you learn it with the commentary of Rashi, the, 
a towering uh, medieval sage. Mm -hmm. So um, in this approach, even within the yeshiva world, uh, you should be a little heretic. Mm -hmm. Don't look at Rashi right away or disagree with Rashi, which yeah. is in certain ways hard to believe how you yeah. could yeah. you could disagree right. with this great sage in order to develop your own reading of the text. Yeah. And that is something that also exists in the yeshiva world. Wow. In other words, there is an attempt to have some kind of dance between great reverence, uh, a belief in the sanctity of the text, and some sort of um, some sort of um, little bit of distance to be able to right. get there. Uh, so there is that continuity between the two worlds. I also, um, I think the notion of chidushe Torah that you should provide insights. Right, I think academically you gotta write and you gotta produce ideas, but also over there you, you need to have a, a you, you need to have a, a hop. You know, you, yes. you need to have an idea yes. that emerges in your learning. Exactly right? in the academic world, there's uh, competition. especially it's a competition. there's competition, yeah, yeah. Uh, which even reflects the world of the rabbis themselves. Right. Uh, it's not enough just to describe something; mm -hmm. um, you have to find something new. In the yeshiva world, that's yeah. often expressed as your own chelik, your own portion of Torah, which is a beautiful idea. Yeah. And you know, in academia, there's a there. You know, it comes down to publishing, and yeah. and they'll only accept your article if yeah. you have something new to say, yeah. uh, and also just the vigor of intellectual life, which yeah. requires newness. Yeah. So that's that's another really important yeah. continuity. Right. That's that's great. Very yeah. nice. So, um, how do these two worlds talk about each other? They're aware they exist. Yeah. And in what ways do they refer, you know, disparagingly or positively to each other? So externally, <laughs> yeah. um, there is a little bit of a war of attrition, yeah, or yeah. there is definitely animosity that's yeah. expressed. Right. Um, in the academic world, uh, the yeshiva world is often looked down upon. Right. They're not critical, uh, right. they're naive, uh, this sort of speaking. Right. Uh, and in the yeshiva world as well, uh, in the opposite direction, they uh, either are disrespectful of the text, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, or they care about right. the things that aren't really important. So famously, uh, they care about what Abaye wore, yeah. uh, the, right. the famous Amora, the famous rabbi, rather than what uh, he said. Ah, uh, interesting. Uh, so, so there is officially animosity. But in fact, uh, yeah, you know, yeah. it doesn't matter how many times you learn Shas, but how many times Shas goes through you. Exactly. How they internalize the yes. values of what Yes, and yeah. the criticism is right. academia is not doing that. Yeah, right. Um, it's, it's always, it always stays right. external. Um, that's officially, right, that's, right. you know, if you listen to the lectures on both sides of the fence. But, but in actuality, there's quite a bit of um, two-way traffic uh, between, the two, between the two worlds. First of all, just in terms of many of the people who populate seats uh, in the academic world yeah. uh, are at least graduates uh, in one way or another of Orthodox yeshivas, oh, sometimes even black head yeshiva worlds. Right. Particularly in Israel, there's a phenomenon. The barrier to entry is so high. Yes, yeah, so you yeah, yeah. right. So one has to. It have, took me years just to figure out like how, what are the tools to actually learn this stuff. Right. right. So this is not to say that one cannot uh, be uh, have have this not have this background at all, yeah. even not be Jewish, right. and really uh, master master the field. Uh, but yes, uh, you know, coming in with that with that knowledge, let's refer to as gears of the yanka, so the things you learned as a child mm -hmm. uh, gives you an advantage. Um, in Israel, you'll often find uh, Haridim, the word for ultra-Orthodox in Israel, uh, people who are in, in libraries looking at manuscripts, doing almost exactly the same things that academics do yeah. because they're reading their work. The ultra-Orthodox ultra, ultra yeshiva world is reading the work, yeah. even if officially this is considered to be problematic. Oh, is that right? Uh -huh. It is right. Uh -huh. um, so so there, is, um, yeah. there is kind of continuity there. Uh, even yeah. where officially there's there's kind of right. um, animosity, yeah. uh, and there is um, I think unspoken uh, or sometimes whispered respect yeah. uh, in the academic world for the tenacity right. and the dedication that you find. Right. That you find in these okay. Yeah. yeah, I'll tell you a funny story. Um, mm -hmm. there, there was a, a, a visiting scholar in the Harvard Jewish Studies Department who once told me that um, uh, he was a scholar of a particular uh, uh, issue. And he was in a Jewish bookstore, and he saw that uh, Art Scroll had written on the subject of his scholarship. So he began to read this book. He flipped up into a random page, and he goes, wow, this is good. This is actually very good. Actually, this is word for word my work. <laughs> and he said, but they can never mention me because they can't admit they're reading me. And I can never mention that I saw this because I can't. I can't mention that I was reading them. Yes. So, right, so, yeah. so, so. That, that, but I wonder, like, how has a field, how has a public, you know, publishing company like Art Scroll, shaped the way American 
Jewish life thinks about Talmud. I mean, when I've looked at the art scroll text, I mean, the amount that they plug into what the text is saying. Yes. For example. I yeah. mean, ha- like, have they had a big influence on... Uh, so one of the reasons why they have and they yeah. remain influential is yeah. that, uh, first of all, until recently, they were virtually the only kid right. on the block. Right. And Sino right. existed, but it was not a very usable translation. Right. Right. Uh, and Translates. and because no one really uh, you know, stepped up to the task, yeah. that's what was available. More recently, right. there's a project with full di- disclosure I've been involved in, which oh, is the well, current Talmud, oh, oh, uh, right. which is not an academic yeah. translation, but tries to stick in a little less into the text, uh, uh, tries to apologize a little less, yeah, 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 and right, try to be right. sort of real to what's there. Right. It is not what we would call a critical translation. Uh, but it's you know it's an excellent translation. Right, okay. Uh, but you know art school is one you yeah. know one way there are art school you know shasim yeah. uh, that are in the libraries of right. great academic right. institutions right. and they are used. Yeah, they are definitely used. So what um, uh, what can these two worlds learn from each other? So that's a great question. Um, I think that each each side has something to learn uh, from one another. Um, on the academic side, learning from the yeshiva world, I think it's precisely the issue of the intensity, mm-hmm. the dedication. Uh, and the styles of learning yeah. uh, that you can learn from. More dialog- I know in my class, more dialogical. Class- yeah. I mean, in my classroom at this point, this is not yeah. uh, you know not anything profound or new. But I often try to break uh, the students into groups. Say, I'm not going to lecture the whole time, <laughs> and we're going <laughs> to learn funny. in a traditional Jewish way yeah. uh, that is called chavrusa, yeah, yeah, study yeah. partners. Right, right. And what they find is initially they can't concentrate. They mm-hmm, can't. Mm-hmm understand a text when their neighbor next to them right. with their partner is, is working through it. But if you de- develop a culture mm-hmm. uh, where this class is together learning yeah. intensely uh, together yeah. right. out loud, right. the cacophony, then we accomplish something. Yeah. Equally, I think in the um, I think in the yeshiva world can learn a little bit of the academic rigor mm-hmm. uh, from the academic world. Right. So not only in terms of acknowledging that what the academics have to say is worthwhile, right. uh, but also even in terms of um, uh, benchmarks, ways of marking and, and measuring uh, that ground is actually being covered. There's right, a great right. taboo in some of the yeshivas against taking tests because yeah. it's seen as uh, secular, as, as not as not demonstrating the love. And there yeah, is some right. truth to that. Yeah. But at the same time, the, the benchmarks and the striving that we all naturally feel when we take a right. test, which is a very academic thing, is yeah. something that the yeshiva world, I yeah. think, could learn from the academic world. So, you know, we talk a lot about, in today uh, today's America, of the lack of civil discourse. Yeah. Um, and some people, sometimes we hear said, oh, we should learn from the Talmud, you know, the, the ethics of argument. And I sometimes kind of shake my head because I sort of feel like, Chazal could get nasty. The rabbinic, they could get nasty. Uh, but I wonder what is a, an area of civil, civil discourse we can learn from them. One area that get, comes up automatically to me is um, uh, preserving minority views. Yes. Um, and the value of quoting um, uh, views that you disagree with and even engaging with each other. But I wonder if there's another, you know, if there's another example you'd point to that we can, t- today's America, merely the Talmudic process can inspire. Yes, well, I think, I mean, what you said is 100% true. They yeah. can get nasty with one yeah, another. Yeah. There are stories in the Talmud of, right. you know, murders or near murders taking right, place, right. which does reflect yeah. the passion. And yeah, there is yeah, something we shouldn't right. discount even in the divided country that we live in. The fact that people are passionate yeah. is valuable. Right, right. Uh, they care. Right. Um, but the rabbis have a caveat. Yeah. They always say that while you're studying, you should be really enemies of one another. You should be so neat. Yeah. Uh, because you passionately yeah, believe yeah. your belief. But at the end, you have to become an ohave. The two yeah, of you yeah. have to love yeah, each other. Yeah. That is missing yeah. for the current discourse, yeah, unfortunately, yeah. in this country. Yeah. That is something I think that yeah. the rabbis counsel and, and advise. And it's something that we should we should start. It reminds for. me of uh, there's the Rav Cook who says, Tomade Chachamim Marbim Shalom Bolam. He says, What do you sages increase peace in the world? He said, What do you mean? They don't increase Shalom, they increase Machlokas, they increase <laughs> argumentation. Because that's the point. That in passionate argumentation, you need passionate argumentation and exploring difference to actually get to a true Shalom. Exactly. Right. And that actually deepens the in the integrity of what you're engaged yeah, with. Yeah, so it so, sounds far off, yeah. but it is an ideal yeah. that we that in our discourse we should yeah. really start So I think for. my second to last question is um, do you have a particular hero in Chazal, in, 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 this, in the sages? Is there, is there a particular figure who you find to be particularly virtuous or insightful? Or? 
So yeah. I have an anti-hero. Oh, okay. Uh, his name is Rabbi Yirmiya, uh-huh. uh, and he often asks questions that are deemed by the rabbis to be annoying. Oh. These sort of technical questions. What if a bird has one foot in this door and one foot in the other door? Is he owned by yeah. the person in this space or that space? Yeah. He is uh, so annoying to the rabbis that he's even kicked out of the Beit Midrash yeah. of the study hall of one occasion, and yet he persists. Right? He is still in the Talmud. Yeah. We still study his words. And I think the lesson of that is that he wasn't kicked in the right, Midrash. Right. Uh, the fact that he was a nundik, that he wouldn't stop at easy pat answers and he kept on going, to yeah. me, is inspiring. Mm. I don't want to be a nundik, yeah, 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 but yeah, I do want to, I don't want to give up. I want to, I want to push nice. myself and, and continue to ask. Beautiful. Yeah. Okay, so my last question is, um, um, I suspect we share a number of things in common, but one of the things we share in common is both being Talmud and of Professor Yaakov Elman of Blessed Memory. Um, and you're mom should tell me, I mean, did a PhD over there and I just did a master's. Um, but I, I was very influenced, uh, by him and I recommend, uh, Professor Secunda wrote an article recently, um, uh, 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 after the passing of Professor Elman, but, which explores the whole, uh, person, but I wonder if you might share one insight as to something, one way he influenced you. So, um, first of all, just yeah. in the conversation we've yeah. been having, he is a yeah. figure uh, yeah. that, uh, that straddled two worlds. Yeah. Uh, he was genuinely, he remained yeah. in the yeshiva world, right. unlike me. Right. Right. Uh, yeah. He remained in the yeshiva world yeah. uh, in Brooklyn. Uh, it was not always easy. Yeah. Uh, there, were, there was sometimes pushback. And he managed to keep his foot in both yeah. worlds. I didn't always live up to that, yeah. but that inspired me greatly. That yeah. he wasn't willing to throw one world out and just take the other. Yeah. He would go to an academic conference right. and be the best friends of, you know, non-Jewish scholars, of course, right. even scholars uh, from an enemy state like yeah. Iran. Yeah. Uh, he, he had relations with them, uh, and yet he remained fully a Hasidic Jew. Yeah, right, right, right. Uh, it's sort of remarkable that he yeah. accomplished this. Yeah. So that's always inspired me. Yeah. That's what I've taken away. Professor Sigoni, you should be successful in all your endeavors. Thank, thank you for you this so time much. to talk. And thank, thank you so you. much. Yeah.